So we talked about last time, and I'm just going to quickly review 3 John 2. He says, Beloved, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God wants us to prosper and to be in health. But it's in accordance with how our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions prosper. If we don't have it on the inside of us, let me tell you something. If you don't get prosperous on the inside first, you'll never be prosperous on the outside first. If you have a poverty mentality on the inside, you'll always be broke. You'll always have insufficiency. But when you change the inside of Romans 12, 1 and 2, says be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And we just saw that the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is for us to be prosperous and to be in hell. But you've got to be transformed. Or one, one translation said, be molded into the image of God. Be molded into his word, what he wants for our lives. We have to change the world. The world will tell you that there'll never be enough. Let me tell you something. As a farmer, a lot of times I, I, you, you start trying to grow and expand and buy more land, lease more land. And the first thing that happens is the enemy comes in and tries to tell me and try to tell I, I, I'm not just me but tries to tell us that there's just not enough land. There's a lot of land out there. Drive through the country. There's a lot of land. Now let me tell you something. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The silver and gold is mine, saith the Lord. There's a lot of money and there's a lot of, there's a lot of provision out there. And how many of you know prosperity just isn't finances? You can have all the money in the world and have a broke home life. And you're not prosperous. You have all the money and be sick. You're not prosperous. Psalm 35, 27 says, Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Deuteronomy 8, 18, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. It's he that gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant with you. It's twofold meaning. It's, it's a, it, his covenant first to make you prosperous. I didn't say, I'm not talking about, you know, I've heard people talk about those prosperity people, the wealth cult. They didn't read the word of God. If they want to be the poverty cult, let them. you got to decide. What are you going to believe the Word? Are you going to believe the religion? It'll tell you, you know, well. And, and, and Pastor Guy, I believe it was last week, talked about poverty has even been preached as being spiritual. But that's not what the Word says. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. I don't know how rich became a dirty word. It became a cuss word in church. It's the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Philippians 4.19 And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. Well, brother, it's just the need. No. According to his riches and glory. It's his riches and glory. The, the abundance of wealth in the kingdom of heaven. And so I want to read if I can get it pull up in here. I want to read the uh, The amplified version of that. Philippians 4.19 And my God will liberally supply fill unto full. Y'all hear shortage in there? Y'all hear just enough? And my God will liberally supply fill unto full your every need according to His riches and glory. Not according to your pocketbook. Not according to the economy. Not according to COVID and inflation, but according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm 92, 15. Psalm 92, 15. Or 11 through 15, excuse me. Psalm 92, 11 through 15. This is the NIV version. I'm sure the King James, uh, New King James Version is up there, but he says, My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. Y'all hear, hear defeat in there? Or victory? The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. 
Do you hear the will of God for your life? To flourish. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. But where you got to be planted? In the bar. No. Planted in the house of the Lord. Planted in, in, in the... Uh, Planted in uh, soap operas. Planted in uh, Dr. Phil. Planted in the view. It's planted in the house of the Lord. In the word of God. Well, brother, I, 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 my time with God, it's a sanctuary on the track. It says planted in the house of the Lord. Why? Because we stir each other up. And praise God, I, I believe somewhere, somebody's preaching this stuff. I know we do here. Surely at the last national church, they'll say. Maybe not. But it's planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Flourish. The definition of flourish, we said, was to flower, to bloom, to break through to spread out, to enter a state of prosperity, increase in wealth, favor, and honor, grow vigorously, expand, enlarge, be extremely successful. That's the definition of flourish. I, I, can I read that again? Y'all missed it. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say that again. To flower, to bloom, to break through, to spread out, to enter a state of prosperity, to increase in wealth, favor, and honor, to grow vigorously, expand, enlarge, and be extremely successful. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. That's a promise. That's your promise. Well, brother, I just need a word from God as to whether He wants me to have anything or not. You just got it. Mark it down. Mark it down, take it home, put it up on your mirror in your bathroom. The righteous will flourish. And then get the definition of flourish. I just looked it up. I just Googled flourish. I think it's the Merriam Webster definition of flourish. That's God's promise to you. So then we talked about the tithe, Malachi chapter 3. Turn your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. Last, last time we talked about the tithe. That God says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. See, there, there's things you have to do. You have a part to play. And first off, he says, let, let me go back up there. He says, return to me and I will return to you. They said, how, how can we return to you? He says, in tithes and offerings. How do we return to the Lord? In time, oh, coming and, 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 and uh, uh, beating ourselves on the back and sackcloth and ash, coming and squalling and bawling at the altar. No, he said in tithes and offerings. That's how you return to me. I don't think you hear that very often in a lot of places. Oh, come back to God, brother. Ask for forgiveness, repent. And listen, I'm not, I'm for all that. I'm not taking away from that. But when's the last time you heard somebody say, oh, come back to God, brother, tie. But God's word, is it not inspired by the Holy Spirit for, to, to encourage us, to instruct us, to teach us? He said, return to me, tie. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Oh, where else in the Bible does it say, test me in this? Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room enough to receive it. And I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines from devouring your crops and the vines in your field will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, where... Here's where we miss it a lot of times because we, we teach on tithing, tithing. If you just do that, God will prosper you. What was that? Not so fast. Because how many of you may be tithing, been tithing for years, and yet you're not seeing the increase that God's Word talks about? It's because there's another aspect of it. It's 
Sowing. It's, it's, it's offerings. Tithes and offerings. He said, return to me. How? In tithes and offerings. You see, the tithe, I want you to see something right here. He says, basically, bring the whole tithe and test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I'm not to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you'll not have room enough to receive it. I'll prevent the pest from devouring your crops. Where are the crops? They're in the field, right? They're in the field. What's your field? You see, here's what, here's what we thought in the church. Well, I, if I tithe, I can go to the mailbox and there'll be all this money. If uh, You know, I just tithe and, and, and bless the Lord. No, you gotta, you gotta sow a field. You have to have something that you're doing. It's in your field. That may be your occupation. That may be your career. That may be uh, farming. That may be whatever you're doing. But you gotta have a field. You have to be doing something for him to bless, to multiply. And, he, and what does he do? He says, I prevent something from happening to you. But then where the multiplication comes in is in the offer. And that's where I want to take up today. So what is the offer? It's after the tithe. Luke 6.38 says, and it's talking about love there, but it's talking about it's a kingdom principle. Give and it'll be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. With the same measure that you use, it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So if you give to God, with a thimble. Guess what? God will honor his word. He'll give back to you in a thimble. Good measure. Press down, shaking together, and running over the side of that thimble. Or if you give to God in a truck, he'll give to you good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over. In a truck. Say, I'm tired of the thimble fool. Oh, come on. Come on. Say, I'm tired of the thimbleful. I don't ask much out of y'all. One more time. I don't, I'm tired of the thimbleful. I'm ready for the truck. And say it like you mean it. Amen. Amen. I like it. Thanks for the participation. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is so important. This is kingdom law. You're good. If you ever hear me talk very long, I start referring back to kingdom principles, kingdom law. Just like we have the law of gravity. You jump off the roof, it's a law. How many of you need to go up to the edge of a building and say, I wonder if I jump off or if I fall? It's a law. You know the kingdom of God has the same kind of laws and principles in it. And it says if you give, it'll be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, running over the same measure you use. It'll be measured to you. It'll be measured back to you. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let's start at verse 6. This is a law. He's explaining. And guess what he's doing right here? Paul is talking to the church about giving. He's talking about giving to ministry. Giving to the kingdom is really where we're at. He's talking about giving into the kingdom, to the kingdom work. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. All right, let's back that up. So that's basically saying if you give a little, then you get a little back, right? It may be multiplied, but it's a little. But if you give generously, what do you get back from God? Oh, I just those people who just give to get. Jesus gave a son to get many sons, the Bible says. Really? It, that's, it's so corrupt, isn't it? It's because it's a kingdom law. I'm not saying God's this uh, slot machine arm and you go up and pull the thing and pull the lever. I'm saying it is a kingdom principle just like jumping off the building. You're going to go splat on the ground. So is the kingdom. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. If you sow 
uh, sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give. Okay. All right, now, I don't mean to step on anybody's toes, but if it does, we'll pray for you at the end of the church service, and God will heal your toes. Do you come to church with a purpose to give? Or do you come to church and you go, oh, oh it's offering time. You got, you got 50 cents? Do you have a dollar? I call that bucket pump. Or do you come? Listen, I, I, I'm not, I have not arrived. But this is a revelation God started giving me. I'm passionate about it because it changed my life. It changed my business. It changed my family. It changed my destiny. Whenever I got a hold of this principle, I saw that I came to church. I already know what I'm going to give before I ever come to church. Marianne and I talked about it. We prayed about it. First off, the tithe, half the time, I don't, Marianne takes care of the tithe because I know we're going to pay the tithe. And every now and then I said, hey, did you tithe on that? Something? She goes, oh, I got to get that thing out. Man, get it because I want it to be the first fruit. I don't want to be it after we paid the grocery bill. I don't, I sure don't want it to be after I paid Visa. So we've got to decide in our heart. Let each one give, the, the, probably that version up there that you have says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart. What do you purpose in your heart? And it's also how often? I mean, do you purpose to just give once a year? It, or, or just at the three feasts? Or one of the three feasts, or do you purpose to give on a regular, consistent basis? And I'm not talking about the tithe. I'm talking about over and above the tithe. The tithe is the first 10% of your increase. And the seed you sow, or the offering, is that that's over and above that. That's what multiplies. You see, the tithe keeps whatever your field is protected from, it, from being destroyed, from the pest devouring from losing it. And the seed that you sow is, is the multiplication. And guess, guess what? I'm not just talking about financial seed. Everything you do in life is a seed. What are you saying to your kids? I heard a, a guy was talking in the last couple of days and I was listening. And he was talking about a father who, who had three, uh, three sons. They wanted a little girl. And finally, number four was a little girl. And he tells his sons all the time, oh, you, you, you. They, they say, Dad, why, why is she your favorite? Well, she just is. She's my favorite. You got it. She, you're going to have to bow down to her. He's saying that to his sons, and I'm going, God, help us. Wow. I, I mean, right now, I tell my grandkids, the ones that can understand, I tell my oldest grandson, I said, you're the best I ever saw. Guess what I tell his little sister? You're the best I ever saw. Guess what I'll tell the other one? It's only three and a half months. You're the best. I already told her that. I smooch all over. I got slobber all over. If she could wipe it off, she would. And I said, you're the best I ever saw. What are you saying? Those are seeds that you're sowing in the life of your children. Whatever you're saying. So it's not just fine. When you go to work, do you go to work, just get on your cell phone, sit over in a corner where nobody can see you? You're sowing seeds. It's weed seed. And you wonder, every time I'm up for promotion, I always get passed over. Wonder why? Or are you going above and beyond? Are you sowing generously in your job, your work ethic? It's a seed. How about your marriage? My old lady, she just nags. She's an old nag. Old gray mule just ain't what she used to be. And you wonder why she's fat and ugly. You've been speaking that to her. You've been talking that over. Or do you say, my wife? The other day I had the opportunity to introduce Marianna, and the Lord just put this in my heart. And I, I said, it's the best thing that ever happened. She's the best thing that ever happened. And I mean it. I, I ain't just saying it. I'm not just saying it to, you know, sound spiritual. 
I said, she's the best thing that happened to me other than Jesus. She is the best thing. Y'all just don't know. I mean, I'd probably show up in dirty underwear here. I don't, and I'm talking about without any pants on, if it wasn't for my wife. I mean, half the time, she's like, I'm like, I can't find my notebook. I can't find my notebook. She goes, oh, you mean this one? And hands it to me. I can't find anything. She finds it for me at the house. Constantly. Here, she, you want me to, last minute, you know, I'm stirring around and she gets in the froth and she goes, here, you want me to type that for you? I was like, would you? Yeah. Get busy. I start talking. She goes, slow down just a minute. I can't type that fast. But what are the seeds that we sow? Everything in life is a seed. And what do you purpose to give? Are you just showing up and last minute going, oh, oh, uh, oh. And plunk it in the bucket? Or have you really prayed about it and said, God, what do you want me to give? I mean, have you asked? Let me tell you something. Start trying this. Start asking God, Lord, what do you want me to give? And what do you want me to give? And then when he tells you, do it. Uh, there's been a time or two in my life, I, I said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And what would thou have me to give? I mean, I didn't really pray like that, but, but the, I, was in the, I was in the religious mode. I said, Lord, what would you want me to do? What do you want me to give? And he said, Give a certain amount over here to this. And I go, get behind me, Satan. And then I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Would the devil be telling me to give to this? I don't think so. So, Lord, that's you, isn't it? And, 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 and you know, the Lord, I, he loves me. He loves me. He really does. He loves me. I, just, I think I just make you laugh sometimes. He goes, you poor stupid thing. But no, he don't say that over me. He says, you're the best I ever saw. But he's probably thinking, you poor stupid thing. He said, yeah, that's what I want you to do. I mean, we just, we're thick, aren't we? I mean, I, I, I don't think it's just me. Maybe y'all, y'all hear it all. And y'all do it all. And they obey, quick to obey. But I don't think I'm the only one like that. So, we, we, we hear the Lord and we obey. What do we purpose in our heart to do? Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Let me tell you something. I think I said this last time. I don't give to places that tell you the lights are going to be off if we don't, if you don't give. I mean, they're the last person I give. I'm going to give to the ones that say, Believe God and he will multiply into your life. Because I know when I give them, they laying hands on it. They're agreeing with me for multiplication. They're not saying, oh God, thank you for just enough. Barely get by. Help him pay his light bill. And next month, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. Come on. I hadn't seen that. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your curtains. Strengthen your cords. Expand to the left and to the right. That's the way he talks to us. That's Isaiah 54, by the way. Don't give under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all great. Listen, when we do this, when we obey, listen to what he does. This is your promise. This is another promise. You can put this one on the mirror, too. And God is able to make all grace abound in you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Somebody say surplus. Who wants some surplus? Surplus for the kingdom of God. And by the way, it's not surplus for all your toys. God doesn't mind you having toys but it's surplus for the kingdom. Are you blessing the kingdom in your life? Are you blessing the kingdom with your toys? Are you blessing? Are you skipping church for your boat at the lake? God, God is, he wants you to have nice things. He wants you to be able, you know, to do nice things. 
He wants you to have a nice car, a nice pickup. To drive to church. Oh, and maybe to go down somewhere else and go serve the Lord, go to the Maya Swap. And I, listen, I, I'm just I'm saying some simple little things, but to get you stirred up to start seeking God for more in your life and not just more for things just to have things. But where can I give, Lord? What can I do for the kingdom? What can I do at Christmas time for the needy? What can I do? What can I do at the church? What can I, what, what, what could we do? What could we do for the, for the city of Hereford? For the region of Hereford? For the kingdom? To win the lost, to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead. That in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he, listen, verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Let's stop right there. He supplies seed. Look, God is so good. I want you to hear something. Not only when you sow does he multiply what you sow, but he supplies the seed to sow. Uh, so y'all didn't hear me. I, I'm coming over here because I think y'all might have heard me a little better. When he asks you to give something, he gives you what he wants you to give. Now everything, I, everything comes from the Lord, obviously. But I'm talking about if you just start opening your heart, God will give you seed that you can sow into his kingdom work, but he'll give you the seed. But you got to be a sower, not an eater. This didn't say, I'll give seed to the consumer. He didn't say, I'll give seed to the lake dwellers on Sunday. I'll give seed to the selfish. He says, I give seed to the sower. In other words, you've you got to have a heart to sow. And bread for food. And will also supply and increase your store of seed. See, there's that. I'm going to supply. If you're a sower, I will supply you seed to sow. Your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I mean, you know that the worst day, if you're a waitress or a waiter, you know the one day of the week they hate working? Sunday, right after church, and all the Christians come in and demand this and demand that and then give them, don't even leave the tip, or give them a measly, you know, you got a tip? Yeah, I got a dollar. And you just ate a $50 meal. Are you generous? He said, it's, it's for generosity. To be generous on every occasion. Hey, guess what? Your waitress is every occasion. Hey, guess what? You know, somebody, you hear somebody's a little short on something every occasion. You help them out. That's what it's for. To be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. See, it, it glorifies God. They say, thank you, Lord. Glorify God with you. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service because of the service by which you proved yourselves. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel. Let me tell you something. Don't, don't go in saying, praise the Lord, and then talk and lack all the time. Nothing makes me madder than people who will talk God, and then all of a sudden they're cheating somebody out of a dive. Or so, or so stingy. You know, fum, fumble for the fumble for the their billfold when it's time to pay out in a group. Huh, let's all go Dutch. I mean, there's no problem with going Dutch. And if you do that, but I mean, you I can tell right off, 
I've gone someplace and somebody said, we'll just go Dutch. We'll just go Dutch. I just want to say, let's go kingdom. I'll buy it. Bill, I get so cockeyed mad at him because I nearly got a hawk time down. I got to go. I, the minute we walk into a restaurant, I said, give me the ticket. If you give him five seconds, he's robbed me of my blessing. I've told him before, Bill, you're disobeying God. I'm supposed to get blessed from this. We fight over the ticket. One time, years ago, when our kid, I mean, when Chip, who's now 30, was probably in the fourth grade. And Bill and I and my mother went into Toot and told him to buy some water bottles for the whole team. And we're going to put them down in the cooler and take them and go over there. And I got up there with Bill and the waitress, and I just wanted my hair was black. And I said, Bill, I got it. Get him. He goes, no, I got it. I got it. We're arguing. And the lady looks at me and says, don't be disrespectful to your dad. <laughs> Woo, that was one time I let him pay. I said, you're right, ma'am. So I said, he is my dad. And I pointed over at my mom. She was back in the back. I said, that's my mom. And Bill goes, I beg your pardon. The only part I don't like about that is Bill's hair is still black. I think if we went in, they'd say that they'd flip it. I ain't going to buy water with you, by the way. I mean, are you always fumbling to be the last one to pay the bill? Are you, listen, he says in all things, a spirit of generosity will bless you. You can't outgive God in everything. And I do it knowing. And, 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 and let me tell you something. We've gone and preached. My farm has grown over seed time and harvest because I said, Lord, in Mark chapter 10, he, he says, you've not left houses, brethren, father, land, for my sake and the gospel that you'll not receive now in this time. A hundredfold houses, brother, father, lands for my sake. I go, Lord, I'm going to preach the gospel. I need another farm. Because I just left a field. And you'll multiply it back. Thank you, Lord. I received it. I said it this morning. I said, thank you. I received more fields. And let me tell you something. I let it slip. I forget. We're, we're to renew our minds to the Word of God. I, I, I told my sons, they left the farm. They left Thursday morning. They left. We had stuff to do. I sent them a text. The Lord, the, the Lord put it on my heart. Y'all want to grow? Go sow. Go work a walk to Emmaus. So I sent them the text. You've not left houses, brother. Fields. One translation says fields. Farms. They left. They left me and Kubis in charge. Well, they really left Kubis in charge. And they left me to see if Kubis was in charge. <laughs> and he was. He had it all taken care of. Thank you, Lord. So we sow generously and we reap generously. And he goes on to say, this service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel. Christ and for your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone else and in their prayers for, for you and in their prayers for you their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you thanks be to God for his indescribable gift grace is unmerited favor but grace is empowerment on your behalf to get what you can't do on your own and he says this far surpassing grace comes on your life. I don't know about y'all, but I want more. I want that grace. I want more of that grace. Grace is known as unmerited favor. How many of you know favor will get you more places than money? Far surpassing grace, and then he calls it the indescribable grace. You know how it's indescribable? When you go, Lord! <laughs> you're like a, when you blow in a baby's face, you know how they go? <laughs> it's far surpassing grace. It's an indescribable gift. It's so good. God is so good. And that's what I want for each of us here today. And I'm telling you, if you haven't experienced it, it's because 
You haven't been sowing. But let me tell you something. There's another part of that. And the Lord's gotten on me. He said, you know, you'll sow all right. But when do you ever harvest? We forget the harvest. A lot of times we get good in the church. We just keep sowing and sowing and sowing. And we forget to harvest. You know how you, you, know how you get a harvest? Mark chapter 4 talks about it. He says, first the blade and then the ear. It says, it's talking about sowing the word, but it's a, print, it's a kingdom principle. You sow finances, you sow seed, and it just starts growing. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. You know, corn just comes up. The soil produces it out of that seed, makes the seed produce that. And by the way, a corn seed doesn't produce a watermelon. So when you sow a seed, you need to designate what that seed is for. You don't just go, I'm going to, uh, oh God, I'm sowing my seed. This seed, you know my need. No, you've got to put a sickle to it. And guess what he says? You know when you put the sickle to it? Romans 10 says, for with the heart man believes. That's, that's first the blade and then the ear. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. When you put the sickle, he says, first the blade and then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear, and then the, then, the, then the harvest is ready. And he puts the sickle to the harvest. You know what putting the sickle to the harvest is? It's when you, beget, when you release it with your mouth. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now get out of that old religion. This uh, salvation just means you get your ticket to heaven. Salvation means you prosper, you, you have healing, you have deliverance, you have well-being, you have peace, you have relationship. It's everything. And you get a ticket to heaven. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth you put the sickle. You believe first in your heart. I'm just telling you, you can do all this sowing and reaping. If you really don't believe it, you just think, well, I, I, he said, I, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. First off, what are you saying? If you go back to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, right after that, he said, he said, your words were stout against me. Are your words stout against God? You may be tied. You may even be sowing. And you say, I just don't know what we're going to do. I don't know. I, I, we're going we're, we're to be broke after this year's over. I don't know how we're going to pay the light, though. I don't know how we're going to do this. It's just, it's going away. You know, there's just too much month at the end of the money. Your words are stout against it. You're harvesting. You're harvesting what you're saying. You, it, it's, it's, it's all kingdom principles. I mean, I don't even have enough time to tell you. It's just, it, this is kingdom revelation that I've spent 20 years trying to walk in. And I let it slip. It's not only sowing. It's not only tithing, but it's what do we say with our words. As a man sows, so shall he also reap. Well, you know, you boys don't matter, but my daughter, she's everything. Guess what you're going to get? Don't say stuff like that. Don't allow that to come out of your mouth. That is the devil. He knows the principle of the kingdom. He just can't operate in full authority. But if he can talk you into doing it, because see, uh, Psalm 103 says, giving voice. He, he, the, the, we give voice to the Word of God. The angels hear it, and then they bring it to pass. But if he can get you to say, I just don't know what, too much month at the end of the money, the angels go, I guess we'll just have to let too much month at the end of the money. What are you saying? What are you saying with your life? You're saying, I'll never amount to anything. Guess what? Don't say stuff like that. Philippians 4. Turn your Bibles to Philippians 4. I'm going to go, I'm going to look in this translation. Four nineteen. And my God will liberally supply, fill to the full your every need according to his riches and glory. But I want you to see more importantly than just that. Now, we've already talked about that. But I want you to see who Paul was talking to. Look back up at the beginning. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. He's talking to the church, the Philippians. He said, you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity, 
opportunity to show it. We're just concerned for you, brother. He's talking about giving. Hang on. It'll be evident. Just stay with me. But you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I'm in need. Paul's saying, look, I ain't need. I, the lights ain't going to go out in the ministry. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. You know how you're content in any circumstance? Because you know God's going to take care of you. You know the lights are going to stay on. You know that you're going to keep going if you're doing it God's way. I know that it's to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in my any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you. In other words, you're the only ones that gave to my ministry. You're the only ones that sowed into the kingdom. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. Talking about your kingdom account. What's going to be credited to your kingdom? You know, you've heard me say when we take up an offering, we do this for you. Not for the church. God will take care of the church. If you don't ever give to God in this church, but through a thimbleful, God will somehow supernaturally find somebody that will believe His word and sow into this. So we're not we're not up here. I'm not preaching this message to try to get any kind of extraction out of you. If you don't want to give it, I say fine, Felicia. God's trying to God's trying to change your life. I'm telling you, I want fruit to abound to your account. I want to see. I saw these guys right here. I didn't tell them I was going to say anything about them, but I always pick on them anyway. These guys right here, man, busted, broke, didn't have anything. I don't even think they liked each other. But she tells about how she came, and they were laughing at the preaching. They sat on the back row, hung over. No, they were still drunk, she said. They came, hung over and still drunk at church. And she was laughing about how stupid it all was until she got born again. They started giving into the kingdom and God has blessed them. God has blessed them. One time one tried to give me a dog. I don't want any more dogs. And, but one... But it was a principle. He, he, he started his, chem, his business with his bulldogs. And he said, God spoke to me and told me to give, me a, give you a dog. I said, listen, I'll receive it and then I'm going to give it back to you. Because I, I, don't, I didn't want to say, no, I don't want it. I didn't want to rob him of his blood. He was sowing into the kingdom. It was a, so I said, sow that dog into me right now. He goes, oh. you know, it was over the phone. I said, I received that dog in the name of Jesus. And now I sew it back into it. And I said, we're both going to get blessed. You gave it to me. You're going to get the multiplication from sewing the dog into me. And I get the multiplication of the dog and sewing it back into him. But it's a principle. I wanted to see fruit abound to his count. So I didn't want to turn the offering down. But I didn't need a dog. I've gone too much. I don't need a dog. It's enough pain to keep the plants in the yard watered when we're gone. And so... I took the offering, I spoke over the offering, and I released it. But these guys, I've seen them over and over again in their life. They're givers, they're generous, they, and God has blessed them. And God will bless all of us if we'll just obey His kingdom principle. And so that's why Philippians, where he said, only you were the ones that gave. Only you ones gave to the kingdom. And that's where he says, and my God, See, he's talking to sowers. He's talking to sowers, not eaters, not consumers. He's talking to sowers. And he said, my God, spoil your name. See, we take that out of context. Brother, you know, people come up and say, well, I have a need. I don't just always say, God will spoil your need according to your I said, do you tithe? Do you give? Then you can say, and my God will spoil all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
It's a kingdom law. If you eat Twinkies and cakes all the time, gravity is going to begin to form. It's a law. You know, it's the same way. It's the same way it is in, in, in the laws of this earth. The kingdom laws, but they're great. Given, it's given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. It's a kingdom law. Man. The first thing the enemy does in a financial famine is put a spirit of fear on you. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. If fear ever comes on you, it is not of God. It's kind of like during the pandemic when the whole church sang, I'm no longer a slave to fear, as they wore their masks and stayed at home. The first thing that happens in the financial famine is he tells you to quit. I've had people say, I just can't afford to tithe. I'm like, whoa, really? You can't afford not to. You can't afford not to. It's crucial to hear the word of the Lord and to do what he says. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 7, 17. First Kings chapter 17. I'm going to start at verse 1. Here we are. Here's Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe. And Gilead said unto Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, run eastward, and hide in the Kirith ravine. Uh, my, my other translations say the, the brook Cherith. East of the Jordan, you'll drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the brook Cherith, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Now think about this. This is a famine that he prophesied. This is a, this is a drought famine that he ministered. He released on the earth. He spoke it. He released it on the earth. God couldn't have done it unless a man first released it. And he released it. He says, as long as, as I'm sure as the Lord God is my God, it shall not rain the next three years except at my word. He didn't say, except at the word of God. He said, except at my word. Why? Because he was releasing the word of God. He knew life and death is in the power of the tongue. You that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. He knew when I release Rain in abundance, it will be released. At God's word, he was listening to the Lord, and he also, he proclaimed the drought. And here he is, he doesn't have anything. He's in a famine himself because of what he proclaimed. But God, in a famine, in a COVID, in a shortage, in a, in a supply chain problem, sent him to the brook Cherith. And ravens, listen to this. Are y'all listening to me? This isn't Alice in Wonderland, a fairy tale. This isn't the three little piggies and huff and puff till you blow your house down. This is the word of the Lord. Ravens brought him food and water. Well, he drank out of the brook. Ravens brought him food. Birds, come along. Fly. How many of y'all want to live off the upchuck of a raven? They brought him food. They dropped bread right there and he could eat. And it wasn't just some little old morsel. He did well. He had enough to eat. And he had enough to drink until the brook dried up. Why did the brook dry up? Because of a drought. But God didn't say, I'm done with you. You know, being my servant is a, is a hard duty, brother. Sometimes you just have to do without. You proclaim the drought, do without some water. He said, now listen, I've commanded a widow, widow at Zarephath to feed you there. And so we look right on down, verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath, for Sidon, 
and stay there. I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring, the, okay, the man of God, the man of God, okay, the televangelist, the man of God. I'm going to say that again because it got real quiet when I said that. Everybody, went, Some of y'all's heads snapped like a rubber band. Did he say televangelist? The man of God, the televangelist said, in a drought, in a famine. He called her and asked, bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink. I always say it like this. You probably heard me say it before. I can see CNN news right now. Televangelist asked for widow's last dime. That piece of pond scum. We need a law to stop people from giving to churches, giving to ministries. And then they show him driving off in his car. They don't know how many cars he gave away. Bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Oh, and by the way, bring me some bread too. And she looked at him and said, As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Do you think she's discouraged? She's looking. She's looking at all she has. A handful of flour and a jar and a little oil. There's no the supply chain. It takes six months to get it. The ships are out in the ocean, stacked up, waiting for me to get. What are we going to do? We have no milk. We have no formula. Can't get a, can't get a this, can't get a that. Can't get a part. The supply chain, COVID, the economy, inflation. Only a handful of oil or flour. A little oil in the jar. What are you looking at? See, she was looking at that, and guess what he said? Elijah said to her, verse 13, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you said, but first make me a small cake of bread for me from what you have, have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord gives rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for three and a half years. Was this time span? For three and a half years in a famine, in a drought, in the COVID, in a short supply chain, in a inflation, in high interest rates. In a crazy government. I'm too old. I'm 58. And what am I going to do? I don't have a job. So she went and did as Elijah told her. And there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. Her, not, just, not just her, not just Elijah, but the whole family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. It's called supernatural increase. But she had to do something. She had to go get some sticks. She had to go get the judge. She had to, and she had to give it into the kingdom. She had to sow into the kingdom. Instead of saying, this is all I got. And what happened? Oh, I did, I, I, there's not enough for me to tithe. I sure, I'm sure not giving an offering. We've got to pay the light bill. You don't even have enough to pay the light bill. What are you talking about? You're in famine. You don't have enough. Believe God and sow into the kingdom. Guys, uh, guy. Bill has an employee waiting for a visa. And Bill told me, I mean, this guy gets a visa 
I, I don't, supernaturally. He didn't even, didn't even have to go for an interview. You're supposed to have an interview. He jumped ahead a year in time frame. He believed God. He sowed his seed. And supernaturally, the, the, the uh, uh, attorney can't even figure it out. She said, well, I, I don't know how it happened. It was, just, it was just one of those things. You got to hear God. Listen, this was a Gentile woman in a Baal worshiping country. Well, I've made some mistakes. So, Gentile woman, she wasn't even a covenant woman in a Baal worshiping, heathen infested country. Hey, that means we can do it. I love America. America is still God's, God loves America. He, he founded this country, and just like Israel, they, they, they'd get hot for God, and then they'd get cold. But hey, when, when wood gets dry, it'll catch a fire faster than anything. And that's what's going to happen to this country. There was another widow, widow or another woman, not a widow, but a woman who, who built onto her house for the man of God. And they were blessed. And then all of a sudden, uh, the debtors came along to take her sons away. And God supernaturally provided for them. God supernaturally provided them. You remember the fish's mouth. Peter and Jesus owed taxes. And okay, think about this. Now, you, you we get so religious, we miss the revelation. Peter was a, he was a career fisherman, right? He went out in big boats, threw nets over the side, and that's how he caught fish. And here they need, they need supernatural increase to pay their taxes. And Jesus says, go out and take a fishing pole and throw it out right there. And the first fish you catch, the first fish you catch, look in his mouth, and it'll pay the taxes. Here's a, here's a commercial fisherman that went out and took one pole. But I always, you know, you, you know it's really easy to fish and catch fish if Jesus tells you where the fish are. And so he goes out with a, one fishing pole, throws it in and pulls a gold coin out of the fish's mouth. You remember at Mount Moriah when uh, uh Isaac was to be the sacrifice by Abraham and he took Isaac to the top and right before he's fixing to slit his throat on the altar, God provided the lamb. Which, by the way, opened it up that we can have the blessings of Abraham. You remember Jesus' first miracle in John chapter 2 where they were out of wine and Jesus took 180 gallons of water and turned it into wine. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. I'm about to close. Verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miracle signs that he performed on the sea. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in his mind what he was going to do. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each. See, Philip went right back to the earth cursed toil and sweat system. Just like we do. All, I, all, all I've got. All I've got, I've got to keep it. Are you going to be in the earth cursed toil and sweat system or 
Jesus was trying to get him to go into the kingdom of God's system. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We've made that into something. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We've made it into a little nursery rhyme that means just seek heaven and you'll be all right when you're dead. But he's saying, no, seek my kingdom principles. Seek the kingdom, the laws, the methods of operation. And Jesus is trying to get these boys to see, look. And, and first thing, old Philip, he goes to the earth curse, toil, and sweat system. Where'd he go? Because he immediately went. It's going to take eight months' wages. All I do is the only way I can ever get ahead is to work harder, work longer, get more pay raises. That's the only way. That's the only way I can get out of debt. That's the only way I can do this. That's the only way I can do that. Eight months wages, not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish. To feed 5,000 men plus the women and children, probably 15 to 20,000 people. How many of you know five loaves and two fish ain't going to get the job done either? And Jesus said, Bring it over here to me. And then what Jesus did was he took it and it says, He looked up to heaven and he blessed it. If you look up the word blessed, it means to sanctify, to set apart. What's he setting it apart, apart from? the earth cursed toil and sweat system. He said, Lord. He, first off, he says, what do you have? One translation, uh, Jesus said, well, what do we have? And they went out and found, they rustled around, they finally found five loaves. This little old kid had five loaves and two fish that his mama sent with him. Not near enough to take care of 15,000 people. But here he comes, and, and you know, how about that kid? He goes, here, you can have it. He didn't go, I got to go all day. I got, I got a long walk home. I'm going to be hungry. He gave it. And then Jesus took it and he sanctified it. He separated from that earth curse toiling eight months wages to get enough money to buy enough food to feed all these people. He sanctified it. He separated it from that earth cursed toil and sweat system. And he blessed God, separated into the king, and all of a sudden it changed kingdoms. And went to the kingdom of God's system. And he said, sit down. And then, guess what? Faith without corresponding action is dead. The Bible says. So what did he do? He started handing it out. And it just kept multiplying. As he pull off, as he pull a pinch off of bread, it's still multiplying. And by the way, they didn't eat one of those little wafer things like you see it. You know, a lot of churches, you know, they got them little old stale cracker things. You know, it's about this big. This is the bread. This is the body of blood. You know, did you ever see that movie? You know, uh, the, uh, that, that actor, and it was big. And he got the little corn on the cob, and he, off the salad bar, you know, those little Cornish corn cobs, and he was going, that's what I always think of every time I see those little stale wafers. Just enough. We just have just enough. God, you know, just enough. He'll only supply me. That ain't according to his riches and glory. Give me the whole corn cob. The big one. I mean, I like to take that bread. You know, in this church, we have to cut them up pre-planned. Because I know how some of y'all are. Y'all was hungry when you came to church. You grab a big old blob of it and then dip it in, and the juice will drip all the way across the carpet until you finally get it to your mouth. And so he blessed it, and it just kept multiplying and multiplying. 15,000, 20,000 people, I don't know, they were all fed, but they were satisfied. They were full. They weren't eating those little corn cobs. Man, I mean, they pulled up, and they had some buffet. And by the way, they were so full, there were 12 basketfuls of fragments left over. That's kingdom multiplication. You want God to bless your life. You want God to bless your finances. You want Him to bless your career. You want Him to bless your business. Start sowing into the kingdom. 
Give your tithe, the first 10% of your increase, and then also sow into the kingdom. Now, we didn't take up the offering on purpose because it's the altar call today. I'm going to ask you, don't just come in today. If, if you didn't come in prepared, if you didn't come in, you know, and, and don't just, hey, you know, if you don't have it with you today, go home, pray about it, and bring it back next week and come to the altar. If you've got something with you today, pray about it. Ask God right now as I'm speaking. I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit what He'd have you to sow into the kingdom today. You, you've heard me tell the story. I was at Oral Roberts University 20 some odd years ago. I was so broke I couldn't pay attention and they took up an offering for the dorms. And I said, Lord, I, Mary and I, we looked at each other and said, what do you think? I said, pray about it right quick. Let's ask the Lord. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to sow $500. It might as well have been $50,000. I didn't have $500. And so I said, how much did God tell you? And Marianne said, $250? I said, I heard $500. She said, okay, give $500. And the Lord spoke to me. I'm, and I, I, I kind of, I shook as I stuck it. I shook as I stuck it into the bucket. And I said, Lord, I don't know how. I mean, I'd given up. I had, I'd had to cough up my IRA. I had an IRA back then. I paid a penalty and I had to give it all back to keep in business. My kids' college funds. We'd sold Mary Ann. She was a stockbroker before we married. And she worked for Fidelity Investments. And we were putting money in mutual funds for our kids' college funds. There were two and four. And we would put money in. Man, we had a plan. We, we puked all that up to the bank too. And I said, God, I don't know how. And the Lord spoke to me and said, if you sow into this university, I'll take care of your kids' college. I'll take care of it. And then 20 years later, or whatever it was, both my sons went to college on full-ride scholarships and came home with money in the bank, savings left over at college. I didn't have anything to do with that. God did, but my obedience brought the harvest. So, I'm asking you today, just ask the Lord what it is He'd have you to give. And I mean, really ask the Holy Spirit. And remember, the devil's not telling you to give. He's telling you, don't do a thing. Just sit there. It's a scheme. It's the altar call. And I'm not, we're not going to pass out the plates. I'm going to take these. We're going to set them out. We're going to scatter them out. I want you to come to the altar. This is, this is business with God. I'm, I am serious about this. I've seen it change my life. I've seen it other, it change other people's lives. And I, I want fruit to abound to your account. I have no, I have nothing to gain out of this. Except for the spiritual the spiritual fruit that God will bless me with because if you grab hold of the truth and it changes your life someday when I stand before the Lord he'll say well done I want to stand before the Lord and him say well done not oh well so if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life before we take up the offering we'll give you a chance to come see I'm giving y'all plenty of time to I'm giving y'all plenty of time to hear God. But if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you want to accept Christ this morning, it's the first step. All of these things, God is a good God. He wants to take your life. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what you do is you receive what Christ did for us and that puts you in righteousness, in right standing with God. And if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want you to raise your hand if you want to accept Christ in your heart this morning. First time. Anybody? I'm looking around the room. Anybody? Quickly. I'm looking. All right. Then I'm assuming we're all born again. We're all believers. And I'm going to open up the altar. We're going to put on a little music or something. Bill, maybe put a little music on in the background. And I'm going to sit down. And you can, come on. And uh, 
I'm going to open up the altar. I want you to come, just you and God. And if you want prayer, I'll, I'll pray over you. I mean, but I want you to come and do business with God at the altar. Because I want to see God. I believe there's careers that will just explode to the next level. I believe there's marriages. By the way, it doesn't, remember, remember one of those, one of those uh, in Second Kings that sowed into Elijah's, or Elisha's ministry, her son died. And he came back. She, she had sowed into his ministry. He laid on top of him. He was restored to life. If you need something to come back to life, your marriage, your relationship with your children, whatever it is, sow a seed and believe God. And come on down and just receive. Whatever it is, rent, anything, the Lord will show you and do what God tells you to do. And I promise you will not be ashamed of the gospel.